Hello, everybody. Here we are. Friday, uh, Good Friday, the weekend of Easter and Resurrection Sunday. I hope you've been able to be with us all for all of the final five parables that we've been highlighting this, this week. And so today is final five parable number five, the parable of the talents, or often it's called the parable of the loaned money or bags of gold. It's found in Matthew chapter 25. Let's read it and then we'll highlight a couple of details. Again, Jesus says, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money or on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> well, again, as with the previous parables, these parables have some disturbing truth, but they have some wonderful truth as well. And God tells it like it is. And uh, he, he, he tells us the truth, wonderful truths that we can learn. This parable, the parable of the talents, is probably the third most familiar parable next to the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. But maybe this parable is the one that is most referred to in the church, especially when it comes to volunteer training seminars and leadership conferences. Servanthood with faithfulness and excellence. As it was said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, we preach that time and time again. But every detail in this parable has been emphasized. The, and the most interpreted detail is the bags of gold or the money or the talents. The difference of the unfaithful servant from the two faithful servants. And it has been taught from every angle and every extreme. Every detail in this parable has been hi highlighted time and time again. So I don't want to be repetitious, but today I simply want to highlight one central truth in this parable. And I want to consider, I want, and I want to consider the master's investment to the servants from the point of God's gift of salvation. I don't want to talk about talents or abilities. I want to talk about what the master has entrusted to us, what God has entrusted to us, and that is his gift of salvation. He's given, to, given it to us freely through his son, Jesus Christ. He gives, to, he gives it to each one who will simply accept it and believe. Simply stated, you cannot just go and hide or bury 
your faith. God has given you the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. We can't just go and hide it and bury it somewhere and wait for that eternal life to start. God wants us to share our faith. Just simply share our faith. Share what we believe and what we have received. And so we need to understand, uh, you know, to, to go and bury our faith uh, might mean you never believed and that you were never really saved. But I, I, that's a whole other topic, a whole other subject. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that a genuine faith in the Master and His Son that He's entrusted to us will and must result in fruit. It's inevitable. If we live faithfully every day and live for the Lord, we're going to gain on that investment that the Lord has given to us. God's true salvation in a person produces a new person. We are a new person. That we have been forgiven of our sin and the old person is gone, the new person lives. And when we live as that new person, we're just going to shine for God's glory. But if we choose to go and bury it, keep it secret, hide it from people, that's just, that, that, that's just not what should happen. And so we need to look at uh, what, what the Lord is saying here in his parable, and then we can fast forward to the epistle of James in the New Testament. He offers a very compelling and motivating message toward the expectation that faith will go to work and produce results. You can't go and hide your faith. You can't go and bury your faith. James, in his letter, contends in chapter 2, he says uh, to his fellow believers, faith without action, works or deeds, is useless. It's useless. If we go and bury our faith, hide our faith, it's useless. It's not going to do anything. His opening challenge to his readers is what good is it? What good is it if you claim to have a faith but have no deeds as a result of that faith? James challenges himself and he challenges the readers by stating that he will show his personal faith by what he does, the result of his faith. What good is such a faith that is inactive, hidden, or just buried somewhere? James boldly states, such faith is not even alive, it's dead. That's kind of symbolic that he went and buried his, the bag of gold. If we bury our faith, we're saying it's dead. We're putting it in the ground and saying our faith is dead. I wonder if James was being inspired by this parable of Jesus as he was writing this letter to the Jewish believers. Anyway, I want to share one final observation concerning uh, this unfaithful servant in this parable. You can see that he was already backpedaling as he appeared before the master. He knew he was already in trouble as he heard what happened to the first two uh, servants and he realized what he had done. He knew it wasn't going to turn out good for him. He was claiming that he knew how the demanding master was. But you know what? He really didn't know the master at all. Because the master, what he did for the other two servants, is he said, come and share in my happiness. This was a good master. This wasn't a master who was going to mistreat his servants. This was a master who was going to bring his faithful servants in and they would share in his happiness, share in his goodness. And so this unfaithful servant he didn't get to share in that because he had buried that which the master had given. So I submit to you, he didn't really know the master at all. And I ask you, how well do you know the master? How well do you know the Lord? There's quite a lot within this parable, but at its core is this truth. God's gift of salvation is offered to all. He gives it to every one of us. For those who accept this precious gift of forgiveness that brings new life brings us a very important responsibility as well to simply share the master's gift. What a tragedy it would be to bury 
such a gift and hide it from others. Don't let your faith be dead, but let your faith be alive and let it shine for the Lord. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Thank you for all these parables. Thank you for these wonderful truths. Lord, we thank you for the precious gift that you have given to us that gives us life. Forgive us, Lord, if we have kept it to ourselves. Forgive us, especially if we have buried it. Lord, as we approach Resurrection Sunday and celebrate that you rose again, Lord, I pray that we would raise up our faith. And if we have buried it, Lord, I pray with your help, renew it and let us live with a faith that is alive and well. Thank you, Lord, again. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'm glad you joined us all week. And I certainly hope that we'll be able to join together this Sunday in just a couple of days and have a great celebration of Jesus' resurrection. Because he lives, we live as well. God bless.